let me see. I, I, I think we're the, we're the only thought-provoking thought group that's been around for a very long time. I mean, admittedly, the Sex Pistols provoked a fair amount of thought and thought in others and so on, it influenced other groups, yeah. But um, since then, there's been a pitiful lack of people with any, any imagination. And as I said earlier, any um, desire to voice their opinions, even once they've attained this platform to do it on, I, I find that a real waste. And um, I can't honestly think of anyone who's, any other groups who have um, been straightforward. I mean, I really think that a lot of our songs are like uh, a slap in the face. To get back to what you were saying earlier about um, the sort of, you know, the perverse whatever, whatever it was you said about the um, attitudes towards our lyrics. I think it's because the, the whole sort of record buying public are just walking around with their ears full of banal nonsense. And um, obviously, when, when we've got so little competition, we must be the most controversial, if you like, and um, thought-provoking group. A lot of people think that, that Jean Marais appeared on the cover of This Charming Man for, for very serious reasons, but it didn't really happen that way. It was just a very spur-of-the-moment thing. And the picture seemed to really reflect the aestheticism that the Smiths really cared about and were interested in. There's a, there's a humorous side to the picture because um, obviously the male figure looking at his own reflection is somehow thought to be quite um, topical and strange. But we, we saw it that way, but it wasn't really there for, for that reason. It was just simply blended in completely with the way we felt about art aestheticism and how the Smiths should be projected and how people should really feel about our impressions of art. The, the reasons for the covers has always been the same. It's very important that people recognize the Smith sleeves in a very, very particular way. And it's happened, it, they're very distinguishable and they're very separate. In our minds, at any rate, people also tell us that they are. So the effect is quite individualistic. <laughs> it, it, when punk began in Manchester, undeniably, it was a very exciting time. It was a very interesting time. It, it, because suddenly, there seemed to be so many people around who were interesting. They wrote, they were poets, they, they had their own stores, they sold clothes, they looked fascinating. Punk seemed to bring out all, all that was hidden within people, for better or worse, but exactly what they were doing wasn't the point. The fact was that suddenly people were there, and there were clubs, and there were independent record companies. Most of them were, were hopeless and ridiculous, but the fact was that they were trying to do something different and special, and they were trying to crush the music industry, the established music industry. And that has to be fascinating. Uh, I would have been, I was 13 when punk rock yeah. exploded. I was still in school, so as far as um, gigs and events went, I, I wasn't really party to a lot of it. Um, I, th I, th I thought there was a lot of exciting music around. The, the frustrating thing for me at that time was that I was suddenly well, I, w I was really getting into guitar seriously and I was frustrated that all these, these new groups who were on top of the pops who really couldn't play, so it came at the wrong time for me. I was looking for a kind of musical um, perfection, being so young and I was just starting to play the guitar by then. So I wasn't really impressed um, too greatly by the punk. I think I was just too young, really. By that time, I was immersed in sort of Tamla Motown records, which couldn't be f much further from punk. I can't align anything the Smiths do with hippiedom. That doesn't happen at all anywhere. It's very difficult because we can talk about cynicism and we can link it to hippiedom. But um, what could possibly be more cynical and more negative than the music industry as it stands now? Because the music industry and so many groups that are popular ref are still reflecting life as it is not lived by most people. And suddenly, when the Smiths come along and aim to project life as it is, as it is lived every day by people, it's very, very dangerous. 
and it's very wrong. And which really seems to imply that popular music, even in 1985, has to be very, very rigidly controlled and nothing serious or nothing valuable can be said within popular music, which of course is a tread. Nonchalance, really. I wasn't, I wasn't too bothered by what Joy Division were doing. Not to sound particularly down on Joy Division. It seems that wherever we, we, we go, uh, straight, when we stray from Manchester, people seem to associate Joy Division with the, the Manchester sound. And I don't really think there's a specific Manchester sound unless it's... Well, I think you've, you've either got guitar groups or you've got non-guitar groups. And I think the, the one thing in common with, with, uh, between the Smiths and Joy Division was the lineup, really. Obviously, people get very affectionate about groups that are no longer with us. And it seemed like the death of Joy Division seemed to throw so many lights on them as a group that were never there when they existed. So I'm personally quite skeptical. It's like the way we feel about film stars that are dead. Suddenly they're wonderful and it's such a shame. Yet when they're around, nobody really seems to care. It's like this whole thing about death. It's, um, it's quite interesting. It's fascinating. It's perhaps more fascinating than life sometimes. So the truth is the same with groups. We, you know, so many people mourn the Beatles, so many people mourn the Doors, and I mean, who really cared about the Doors when they actually existed? I don't think they even had hit singles. Well, Sandy Shaw was out for a long time because she, she never made good records, quite justifiably that she, she, she dropped in popularity in England. But let's not forget that throughout the 1960s, she had a string of vital hit singles. She was a very important figure. The word revived in terms of Sandy's career is quite brutal because it implies that she was, you know, a, a, an emotional wreck and, and we, we, we operated on her, which is almost true. <laughs> We had such fondness for her that we just did it without really question or, or without any serious, deep, intellectual debate. It just happened, and it was, a, it, it, was a very, it was a very uplifting thing to do. It wouldn't really do to analyse the situation. Time is so um, precious that we, now things move so quickly for the Smiths that it's very, very difficult to think of almost anything else when your entire day is consumed in what you do and just getting from one point to another, that it's really impossible to, to foster the careers of other individuals. Well, if that does, if we do find ourselves with some time, it might be nice to try some, yeah. something with a <laughs> sandy. Painting. We're not closing any doors. Ben and Tracy were quite supportive of the Smiths when we, when we began, and they travelled far to see us in, in many cities. And um, we were flattered by this, obviously, with the, their um, acquaintances, and we call each other from time to time. And um, I believe that the new LP does sound quite um, guitar-influenced. And I mean, obviously, Ben's a, good, a guitar player, but uh, people have been making comparisons, and that, that is quite flattering because he's a good musician. Um, as far as playing on their single, that was really a spur of the moment kind of um, spark that um, I enjoyed, really. I, th I thought that it was not one of their better songs, I admit, but it was OK. <laughs> the way I see it is that we're musicians and um, we, we make records and uh, the, we, we believe the records really stand up for themselves. If people are allowed to hear them, then they can make up their own minds. I mean, there are so many, there's, there's a, a long list of um, arguments against doing videos. I mean, we, we really would be actors if we wanted to appear in videos in a conventional manner, surely. And um, I, pers I personally find it, other than just being behind the guitar, find it quite embarrassing. So, I mean, it, maybe Morris has got some stronger opinion, but I, yeah. I just don't think it's really that important. When groups make videos, they they're not thinking about music, and it's a part of their life where they're shoving music and they're shoving their initial craft into the background. And so many people 
say that videos take up so much time and they're so tiring, whether the end result is interesting or not, the fact is, is that they're shoving the music into the back while they concentrate on something which is quite, um, which is quite um, non-musical and in most instances, nothing whatsoever to do with um, records. And that's quite sad because it means they're leaving the, 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 the loyalty to their craft behind to step into a field which they're not really interested in and which they, they don't really feel is important to them. Video is just total music industry manipulation of the artist. It always has been, it always will be.